That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. And we will leave you with a... I can't do it. We'll do it live. We'll do it live! Fuck it! I can go write it, and we'll do it live! We'll do it live! Fucking thing sucks! In five, four, three. Hello and welcome to the very seventh episode of Fuck It, We're Doing It Live. As always, this is a live podcast unless you're listening to the recording. So you, that's you, the audience, you can and should participate. You can always call in directly at 713-367-1534. That is 713-367-1534. That number is going to be in the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the whole episode. So if you've got something to say at any point, just call in. Nolan is here to talk about the first real 2022 Oscar contender, or I guess the first movie of 2022 with Oscar aspirations. We'll talk about whether or not it's a contender a little later. Uh, I'm talking about Death on the Nile. Somehow this one came out before Cyrano, which is nominated for some 2021 Oscars. I don't know how that makes sense, but, you know, I'm not in charge, so that's fine. We'll also be talking about the new Amazon Prime romantic comedy, I Want You Back, starring Charlie Day from Always Sunny in Philadelphia and Jenny Slate um, from, I guess, Parks and Recreation as Jean Ralphio's sister and uh, I believe one season of SNL. Jimmy, uh, Jenny Slate is hilarious, though. Love her. As well as Steven Soderbergh's new movie, which is called Kimmy. And I believe that's, I want to say, also on Amazon. Nolan, am I correct? HBO Max. HBO Max. Okay. Jackass 4 took the 2022 movie title belt last week, so stick around to see if any of those can beat it. The Super Bowl was this past weekend, so to celebrate, we're going to do some superb owl trivia. I will ask five questions about everyone's favorite Tootsie Pop mascot, and if you can get them all right, you could win the contents of tonight's swear jar, which is actually currently valued at 25 cents. Sachs cleaned us out last week with the... uh, state-sponsored Chinese trivia. But every time I curse tonight, that's another 25 cents in the jar for you to win in Superb Owl Trivia. That number's only going to get higher. It might be a little cheap right now, but it could get very expensive. We'll be doing Superb Owl Trivia at the end of the show tonight, so stick around. It'll definitely be a hoot. Sorry. I'm going to be playing some royalty-free music for y'all tonight, a little bit of transition stuff, you know, especially when I'm waiting for you to call in. Apologies to those of y'all listening to the recording, but I do have to edit out a lot of the music before I post this anywhere. But if you want to hear some great tunes from our house band, the Truck Stop Lizard People, who almost exclusively play Mark Rebier's songs I've downloaded from YouTube, you're going to have to tune in live on Twitch every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Central Time. Shout out to Mark Rebier for being a pal, making all his music free to play on Twitch. I also did some internet crate digging this week and found another great song, this time with a video. Shout out to the DJ, uh, 2TYF, for replying to my DM in the first place, which was weird, and giving me permission to play a song here. We made it through last week's show without any real technical issues, you know, knock on wood, but let me know in the chat if anything sounds off tonight. The crime hotline is back this week, so if you've ever thought about committing a crime, give us a call. I will help you plan it out. If you, ever, uh, if you ever fantasize about killing your ex or a head of state, if you ever wanted to rob a truck way station or a hair salon, or maybe you just want to watch the world burn, whatever it is, give us a call at 713-367-1534, and I will do my best to help you execute your vision and your victims without spending a minute behind bars. I've got a great show for you tonight. I'm drinking Pernod again, uh, you know, because that's just what I do now. And we're just getting started here, so stick around after the break for our crime hotline and some talk about Death of the Nile. But first, I've got a word from our sponsors. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, MyPillow was once the fastest growing company in America. Now, the liberal media has turned us into one of the fastest shrinking companies. With pillow sales in the toilet, pardon my French, we here at MyPillow realized we only make one thing, and that's pretty goofy. 
So we came up with a way to diversify our products and take care of those nasty Democrats once and for all. Introducing My Voting Machines, the only product that guarantees the GOP wins every election fair and square. Our revolutionary voting technology double checks every ballot to make sure you pick the right choice. And if you don't, I'll fix that up for you, free of charge. Don't let the deep state Democrats drag you down. Get your county a My Voting Machine. My Voting Machine. It only counts my votes. All right, and we're back. And now I'm going to go ahead and open up our crime hotline. If you ever fantasize about killing someone, robbing someone, committing financial fraud on a global scale, vehicular manslaughter, or any other sort of wacky hijinks like that, give us a call at 713-367-1534. That is 713-367-1534. Whatever it is, we can help you get away with it. So give us a call. And now I will play a little bit of intro music for you, or interlude music for you. This is Deep Fake Kevin Harlan, and you are listening to Fuck It. We're doing it live. We're doing it live. All right, it seems that our criminals are out on the streets tonight instead of, uh, you know, listening to my podcast, which I gotta say is a little bit disappointing, but that's okay. That is okay. So, I guess we'll just move on to Death of the Ni- Death on the Nile. Nolan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Nolan's here, everybody. Alright, so... Death on the Nile is an adaptation of an Agatha Christie novel. I guess this is sort of a sequel to Murder on the Orient Express, which came out in, I want to say, 2017. No, that's too early. I think it was like 2019. 2019? Let me do quick, hey, quick no, Google let me here. Do. I got it. Um, vamp. <laughs> well, I mean, I should... I would. Did you see the Murder on the Orient Express? No. I or have you seen any of the uh, murders on the Orient Express? Nope. This would uh, this would be my first experience with an Agatha Christie novel outside of the Doctor Who episode where they travel back in time and uh, save Agatha Christie from an evil wasp alien that is the um, insect, not the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Ah, gotcha. Sorry. And by the way, you're right. It's 2017. Oh, nice. Yeah, good for you. Um. So having never seen you never I'm guessing you've never read the story then? Nope. This was all Have you read me. Have you read Murder on the Orange Express? Nope. Oh, really? Okay. I'm so, I'm surprised. Anyway, so um like I've only read that one, but the like overwhelming sense you get from just that book is that it has like it's it's it is clearly all about the plot. Um and like to a degree this one is too, but it's the way in which uh you're introduced to that plot that I, you know, I would say is probably like the biggest issue I had with it. Did you have any thoughts on that? I know. I mean, it's pretty easy to follow overall. Yeah, no, this is not, a this yeah. is a slow, slow burn. I mean, there's like a ton of setup involved and it, it does all pay off in the end, but it takes so long to get into the actual mystery. I mean, the actual mystery itself is fairly long and complicated for you know, a single location murder situation, but yeah, the setup the is like a full a hour. Easily, it's a full hour. More. Yeah. Yeah. And of a two hour and t- seven minute movie. Yeah. Um, which no, is, which was get on the boat until probably halfway through. Yeah. And the rationale for getting on the boat. I mean, the thing is, this thing is, and maybe this is why you like it. It is so silly and like overproduced and shiny and everybody's so attractive which is fine that's not like in itself a bad thing it's just that when there's like literally nothing else going on you know it's not really a compelling movie and then so right as a consequence i just didn't care about the plot and then without the plot what's who done it yeah i guess you're right i mean y- you're definitely right about one thing. It is very shiny. The production design very is shiny. absolutely incredible. I mean, it looks no, like uh, some, some old Hollywood shit. That's not what I meant. <laughs> I mean, it would look like old Hollywood shit if it didn't look like it was wrapped in cellophane. Okay. Well, 
I kind of understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I was into it. It looked less artificial to me than, say, like a Nightmare Alley. Wow, that's so that's interesting because I would say basically the opposite, although both in the same kind of direction of I'm not buying it. But this one leans into, like I said, the fun rompiness of it way more. So, you know, I I guess I mean, really, the only one who's playing like a romp is Poirot. He's like the only goofball except for, I guess, his sidekick. But even then, not really. He's got some pretty serious plot going on. I didn't really see this I as mean, a goofy movie. It felt like a pretty straight laced mystery. I, I dude, are, do we? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, dude, this movie was so like I would. I don't know how to describe it other than like, uh, like like I would say it was like a murder romp. There's nothing very serious about it, and maybe that's just because of the way it looks, and also how much time it devotes to things that I guess aren't the mystery, which. You could argue is set up. I would argue is just, you know, sleep inducing. Um, yeah. But like, for example, how could you say? How could you not say this is a romp when there's two of the, I want to say almost pornographic, like dance scenes that happen right back to each other, where people are the closest I've ever seen to intercourse with clothes on. But they're plot like, relevant, dry hump scenes. I mean, yeah, but it's so weird. <laughs> that it's so it's not like goofy. It's like you know, it try, is it's so trying goofy. to be sexy. It's trying to be sexy. And no, I mean, yeah, it's trying to do it, that. It works. That's what I'm for saying. Because you know, both of the. I mean, I guess they're the female leads, right? Gal Gadot and uh, quick Google here, but they're name, both name, name escapes you. Incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Um. Oh God, what is her? Wow, she's like really low on the cast list shame but she is beautiful i know you're talking about the english one um, yeah you know the uh emma emma mackie is her name here emma mackie huh i wonder what, what else she's been in she's been in uh, um eiffel from 2021 which is uh that's not about the creation no. of the eiffel tower that's all i got sounds well riveting. Pretty, pretty good debut for her she turned in definitely one of the stronger performances here granted she has probably the most interesting character but I was definitely like eyes on her on the screen, except Poirot. But yeah, he, he kind of does like he's a little Jacques Cousteau or Clouseau, right? Pink Panther. Cousteau yeah, is like the uh, submarine guy, and Jacques Clouseau is the Pink Panther. Whatever, Pink Panther. Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, Jacqueline says that she was also in Sex Education. That's why I was gonna say, is she May uh Mae Eve from Sex Education? She is. It's those cheekbones. Ah. Uh, Knew it. Well, right. she's thanks, excellent. Jacqueline. Shout love outs. her. Love her in Sex Education. Love her in this. Do too. And she is you're right. She's totally the best the best person in this. But on the like on the flip side, I just thought like those moments, I guess that what what you're considering are like attempts and I don't want to say serious tense, because I don't think it was very serious. But like, well, it's not like it's that, not like gravely intense, but it's not a comedy. Well, <laughs> it's not like a send up. Their libidos anything. would argue. <laughs> well, look, I mean, if if everybody that I hung out with was as hot as Gal Gadot, Army Hammer, and uh, oh wow, Emma Mackey, right? Like, yeah, nice. You really <laughs> <laughs> nailed You're looking it. Looking at it, nailed it. Um, <laughs> if if the people I hung around. Uh, if the people I hung around with were that hot, I mean, oh, dude, you get it. Oh, so I see. So I, she I totally you sympathize. Get I get it. Oh, so uh, okay. No, never I mind. Mean, so I, I, I understand now I why you see like myself this in that position in at any day or any time. But if I were fortunate enough, fortunate enough to hang out with such attractive people, I mean, it it only makes sense that they're all just incredibly horny. Yeah, and also, you know, how convenient. Poirot, he's in this club just to watch some music and eat six French desserts. And then, oh, look, two people basically fuck on a dance floor. I hope that's relevant. <laughs> and guess well, what? Oh, yeah, it's it is hugely relevant. important. It's incredibly I know, important. I know. So are you complaining that they didn't waste a whole scene, like that it wasn't just gratuitous sex dancing, that it was actually Honestly, relevant? Is that a negative for you? Honestly, yeah, because Paul Verhoeven would have had the balls to make this like way funnier. Okay, which no, it already now, was. Now we're into like completely different territory. Paul Verhoeven could not, oh, God. could not have handled the intricacies 
of <laughs> oh, this movie. God. Like uh, that, you know, He's, not hey, that I wouldn't he, love to see him do like a noir or something like that. He but has, dude. Paul it's Verhoeven called Basic of, Instinct. Okay, that's different. That's an erotic no, it's thriller. A, that's not a it's th- the, detective story. It is a detective story. Yeah, Nick, but no, I want to say Castle. Not. What's his name? Nick Castle? Yeah, or whatever. Michael Douglas. I haven't seen, I haven't seen that movie a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> that I mean, he it is a detective. It's actually it is a noir. It's supposed to be like kind of a Hitchcock. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Back to Death on the Nile. Oh yeah, um, you know, Hitchcock, another the movie. Famous, the famous noir filmmaker. Right? Okay, but hold on. There is kind of I want to say a deliberate Hitchcocky type feel towards to this movie, and it, that's definitely deliberate. Uh, um, maybe. like. For no, for example, kind of like the travel log nature of like some of his movies from the fifties and stuff. Like I think the man who knew too much, the remake, you know, where he goes to Northern Africa and Egypt and Morocco. So you mean just like, you know, like his most expensive movies? Yeah, but this movie spends all of its money on on cast and none of it on location or visual effects, which were again so bad i yeah, don't I, I didn't they look like a video game and not a, a great one yeah i didn't believe that they were in egypt for a second it did look like a soundstage but at the same time i was like whatever the boat was real and that's where everything happens yeah that's that's true but you would think at least if it's based on a book that is from a woman who's known for her like explicit and intriguing plotting this movie would have something in the that way that captivates you like the best whodunits also get you in with like a different kind of feeling. Like this movie's trying to get you in with this kind of very glamorous, uh, you know, like you said, like, you know, all these super hot people all in one place. What's going to happen? The Last of Sheila is basically like a comedy that's also whodunit. Same for Clue, where they have great characters and stuff like that. Right. Um, and I think, I, I think even for being such a slow burn, which is a structural mistake for a murder mystery like this. Um, Um, Interesting. Well, like, give me another example where that happens more than halfway through. The inciting incident. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, you could (laughs) argue the inciting incident is the... uh, Is Uh, the the dancing. dancing. Hey. Oh, God. Hey, 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 hey. (laughs) Clearly it is. Clearly it's meant to be. And then, you know, it's, obviously I haven't weird. read the book. Have you, have you read the book? I mean. No, but I can guarantee it does not say, quote, they fucked on the dance floor, 1939 London. Right. I can bet. Right. Do you have to, do you have to hit the pitch counter for me or is that just. No, nope, just, just me. I can't let you guys just blatantly exploit my. My swear jar like that. If I let you do it, I mean, it would just be people saying like "fuck, fuck, fuck" all the time, and just uh, yeah, costing true. me a lot of money. Yeah, just trolling me. I'm not gonna open myself up to that. Fair enough. Fair enough. What did you think of Kenneth Branagh as Poirot? I thought he was a goofball. I mean, I respect the hell out of Kenneth Branagh because he really is just like out there busting his ass and putting out pretty decent stuff. All the time he's definitely consistent and he's solid i mean he does very faithful adaptations have you if you've seen his hamlet it's just like i mean it's what you would expect with hamlet on the big screen and death on the nile was what i would expect with agatha christie on the big screen so he's very capable of executing just like a solid adaptation as Poirot, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the thing is, it's Kenneth Branagh, so you know he read like every Agatha Christie book like 19 times. Um, did, did, also, that... shout out, shout out Willie. Okay. He's okay. in the chat. Um, shout out Willie. What's up, Willie? Um, but he, I guarantee you, he's read like every Agatha Christie book back to front like 20 million times. So he's definitely playing the character as written. I have enough faith in his ability to adapt things to say that. But. Like I said, it's a little Jacques Clouseau y. Um, but that's okay. But it doesn't really fit the rest of the movie, which I guess for you it might, because we read this very differently. For me, it's like a very, really? very straight up mystery. And he is a little bit too goofy. I don't know. And it, I want, I just think in the kind of like the age where. I guess there is such a divide between like what is kind of serious, I guess, aka like gritty reboot. And I would say like this, this is in the other category where it's it's so right. bright and shiny and, and quippy 
I felt like that kind of similar style of humor. Although none of I did you laugh? I don't can't I can't say I laughed once. No, I didn't, um, I didn't laugh. It's not like a funny okay. Thing. Yeah, I know, but like you know, even especially like Murder on the Orient Express, it's not like a laugh out loud thing. But like everybody's got a little wit, you know. Everybody's got a little, and the only one that with wit is Poirot. And I gotta say, I don't think for a detective movie, in terms of plants and stuff like that. I wasn't really buying Paul Rose detective stuff. I mean, it just is yeah, convenient very more than convenient. anything. You know, it just pops out and like, wait, and this is a, I'm going to make a quote. It's totally out of context. So it's, it's not a spoiler. The bed was folded differently than right. it was two days before. And you're right. like, and Jesus that's just Christ. Like so, so meaningful. It and was damning. Like, yeah. And the thing is, is it's not like the, uh, the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies where they show you how he gets to his conclusions, you know, with like the cool, you know, like scenes good movies. Stuff. Right. Yeah. It's <laughs> just all of a sudden like, oh, wait, the has me do counters. And you're like, oh, OK. All right, Poro. Yeah, he's not a very good or he's just not a very convincing detective other than like, oh, my God, he's literally has all the answers. All the time. Um, all the time so i don't know this one i would say is definitely the biggest sin was forgettable and boring um and too shiny but you could do worse i mean it's a great movie for a sunday afternoon it's a if you're looking for a sunday afternoon nap something kind of in the sun this is a good one well you know why because it doesn't matter the average age in my theater was probably 65 60, 65 yeah easily and they and loved all of the the poirot quips they of course dude, they loved it i mean that's really who agatha christie is for and at this point kenneth branagh i don't know exactly how old he is but you know the dude the dude does not play very young i'll say that no let's see how old he is um he was born. Wow, he's twenty-seven. Oh no, he's sixty-one. No bullshit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sixty-one, my ass, man. Come on, or not sixty-one? Sorry, twenty-nine. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. So yeah, this one I'll file away as uh, just so-so. Right, it's fine. I could see it. Okay, Oscar consideration, because we both know this movie is definitely has Oscar aspirations. Kenneth Branagh always does when he brings something I out do. at this point in his career. I think costumes and PD have a shot. I don't think PD has Nothing a shot in else. hell. Costumes, maybe. The hair PD, and makeup, the sure. The PD is solid. Especially Dude. if Nightmare Alley takes it home this year. It could be. It well, could be also... Moved. Costumes by the way, were great. the costumes were great. Let's let's put that out there. By the way, Cyrano was released last year, just not in Houston. Yeah, Cyrano comes out like at the end of the month here. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Yeah, I could see cost- costumes here, make a PD sure. Everything else, I really don't think this is even an Oscar considered movie, just because it's uh it's being released before this year's oscars right and i mean that yeah, means it's, it's it, definitely and nobody's early, campaigning early year movie. dump spot 100 percent. yeah this is an early year dump Especially so i really don't so, even so so soon after belfast it yeah. does feel kind of like a dump but i'll it, i'll say on the pod here that it doesn't even get a nod for any of those things all right i mean no chance. you could be right i could see costumes from pd but the, I will say that this is a very encouraging sign for the rest of the year. If this is an early year dump, this would have been like a a pretty damn good movie in 2021. So I think maybe we're coming out of the COVID slump and all of that stuff that's just kind of been on the back burner for a couple of years while they wait for people to go back to the movies might start trickling out this year. And that would be pretty excellent. Oh, Jacqueline's in the chat asking if Death on the Nile could win a SAG ensemble award. I don't think so. I mean, no Jack way. There's going to be a there's better be... ensemble cast than this movie. True. Um, but I would say, yeah, probably no chance just because, like I said, nobody's campaigning for this movie. And one of those members of that SAG ensemble would be Army Hammer. So no and chance. Gadot and Russell Brand. This is a very controversial cast. I will say I love Army Hammer. I don't care. I don't care. He was very good in this. Him and... Uh, Emma Mackey. Um, 
were really good. Army Hammer is just fun to watch. He just has like a, a kind of that magnetic energy in his characters. I don't know, man. When he does British accents, because he's extremely similar to the character he plays in Rebecca, I'm just like, I, I again, as with the rest of this movie, I didn't buy it. I don't buy it at all. Um, but, you know, that's okay. That's not really what this movie's for. All right. Well, Jackass still holds the, holds the belt. Yeah, I was sure. about to say, where are we at on the 2022 movie title belt? I believe Jackass 4 is definitely still the champion. I'm guessing you're not even nominating. Are we not even throwing Kimmy and uh, I, want I Want You want Back you in back. the Ring? We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. But for okay. now, Death on the Nile is, is still the champion. Or not Death on the Nile. Death on the Nile can, cannot take the belt from Jackass no. 4. No. Absolutely Jackass 4, not. best movie of the year so far. Not really any contenders coming out anytime soon, except for Batman, but, you know. Yeah, Batman comes out soon. Hold on. There, there was. Get... Last time we... Hey, hold on. Jacqueline pointed out Deep Water's coming out soon, and that's supposed to be pretty steamy. It's being offloaded to Hulu, which is a really interesting sign. What is, uh, what is Deep Water? Really is interesting. It, who's doing that? It's an adaptation of a Patricia Highsmith uh, novel that's really good. Um, okay, that name by... doesn't mean a lot to me. Ah, dude, read a fucking book one. Okay. Um, so, adaptation, Patricia Highsmith by Adrian Lyon, who directed, uh, shit, Jacqueline, what's it called? You know, um, Fatal Attraction. And Nine oh. and a Half Weeks Later. Oh. Yeah, exactly. And it's starring Ana de Armas oh. and, uh, and uh, what's his name? Sorry, Ben Affleck. Um, okay, those are the two is, leads, is, and it's a really good plot. This is buzzy. it's really good, but it got thank thank you, Jacqueline. Um, it got it got moved from it originally was supposed to be in January, then February, then moved to March on Hulu. So either it's gonna suck, or something really controversial is gonna happen. I don't know, but really interested. I'm excited for that one. That is intriguing, and uh, I don't know if you saw this, Nolan. I know you tend to avoid trailers, but the trailer for Nope finally came out after seeing, you know, countless ads with just clips from Get Out and Us, which honestly I really enjoyed as a marketing strategy. You know, like I don't know what Nope is about. Seeing the teaser didn't change that for me. All that I'm really going for is it's Jordan Peele, and I know he's going to make something really excellent. So yeah, I think I mean, just, just using old footage from Jordan Peele movies and playing that, I got five on it, theme from us, was a really good marketing call. And then the Super Bowl trailer, If you did you watch it, Nolan? For which one? For Nope? For Nope. I caught the back end and I was happy about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's not a lot of story in there. I will say yeah. it looks like Tremors a lot, which makes me really good excited. Sign. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen Tremors, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that movie. It's just a lot of fun. Kevin Bacon plays like a ranch hand in a valley in Nevada, and there are these giant worm things, I guess, that just start yeah. ripping up the earth and causing earthquakes. It's excellent. That movie, the uh, Grabbers, that I recommended a, a few weeks back is very similar as well. So that made me pretty excited for Nope. I think that that will probably take the title belt at some point just based on the fact but, that it's Jordan Peele and looking at the lineup between now and then. And we both like Jordan Peele quite a bit. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the lineup now and uh, there's a, I would say there's a couple, but not, not exactly worth mentioning. We'll get to them later down the line. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, Jackass four for now you hold the title belt next up. Uh, I've got another ad for you guys and then a little music video. Uh, it's pretty good. I didn't do it. I didn't have anything to do with it. Mostly I'm just surprised that the artist responded to me and gave me permission to play this on the stream. After that, we are going to go into part two of our movie talk for this week, where we'll be going over Amazon's new romantic comedy, I Want You Back, as well as Steven Soderbergh's new movie, Kimmy. And we still have superb owl trivia coming later, so stick around if you want to win some big money. White people? What a bunch of losers. Ew, this party is so white. Man, aren't white people the worst? That's the kind of stuff I used to say before I upgraded to White People 2.0. Hi, I'm Tanner. 
Here at Whole Foods, we know white people. We also know that recently, white people haven't been the best. It's time for an upgrade. With White People 2.0, you can smoothly transition from your disgustingly racist self into a person fit for modern society. Our whites are developed in a multicultural environment. They love foreign movies like Parasite and... Parasite. They listen to rap music and not just Eminem. Some of our sturdier models can even handle spice up to a level 4 on the FDA's Indian restaurant scale. White People 2.0 also come with special linguistic technology that enables them to speak every language in the world. English, Spanish, and even French. Take a listen. Hello, my name is Tanner. Hola, me llamo Tanner. Bonjour, Jim Apple, Tanner. You know you want to be the best. So head to Whole Foods and get your upgrade today. White People 2.0, Superior Whites. So, Death on the Nile may have been the major release to come out this past week, but it definitely wasn't the only movie that came out that's worth talking about. Amazon put out a new romantic comedy titled I Want You Back, starring Charlie Day of Always Sunny in Philadelphia and Jenny Slate of just general comedic fame. Um, Nolan, are you there? I'm here. All right. So, I Want You Back is just, you know, your classic romantic comedy. And I gotta say, it's nice that this kind of movie is still getting made. Kind of the same thing I said, like, with Death in the Ni- with Death of Death on the Nile, Jesus, um, with Death on the Nile, is, it's just, you know, it's nice to see kind of a mid-budget movie with A-list, B-list actors in it still getting made because it seems like you know in the past few years it's been a lot of marvel a lot of indie a lot of horror which you know i miss this kind of movie so it's nice it's nice to see big comedy names or you know middle to big comedy names in a romantic comedy with some good production value yeah i would say i mean like i can't even remember the last movie that was kind of just a straight through rom-com that was kind of a major release. You know, they have this kind of self-aware ones. Like I think one with Rebel Wilson and was it Adam Devine that came out a couple right, of years ago? Right. Uh, and I guess romantic, yesterday I believe is, yeah, is what it's called. Another one I didn't see, but the, is it Richard Curtis movie? Um, yesterday. Oh, you right. Know. The Beatles one. Yeah. The Beatles one. So, I mean, um, so tell me like, what, what did you think of it how, from a comedy standpoint? Like how funny was it? Um, the comedy's good. Uh, it's, it's very mainstream romantic comedy kind of comedy, nothing too out there or edgy, which was kind of surprising considering the cast of Jenny Slate and Charlie Day, who are definitely capable of kind of taking it out there successfully. They've done it in the past. That's where they're, they're funniest, I think. Um, Jenny Slate is good in this, but like I said, I just, you miss the wackiness. Like, Jenny Slate, the Jenny Slate we saw on SNL and Parks and Rec was really kind of crazy and I think hilarious. And I kind of, I totally respect, you know, her decision to kind of go a different way and take slightly more serious roles. This isn't a serious role, but I mean, this movie's not a total goof off. It has, it's sincere, right? But I do miss the kind of wackier side of Ginny Slate. And it does slip through a few times in this movie, and those are probably the funniest parts for me. I mean, when you say it's sincere, are we talking like the big six sincere or like crazy stupid love? I mean, look, it's it's not, definitely more crazy stupid love because it's not the big sick. It's, it doesn't have like any sort of intensity or darkness or edge to it at all and that's fine that's the kind of movie that it is um yeah i will say that my biggest issue with this movie was like i guess the writing most of it is fine like the dialogue is good the writing is fine the character development is nice i really like the way that nobody in this movie is really a bad person except for uh jenny slate and charlie but they're the protagonist, so it's okay. You know, like, the audience is able to excuse it, but none of their exes or their exes' new boyfriends or girlfriends are bad people. 
but they still have a lot of conflict and uh, I thought that was pretty elegantly done but the story has like major save the cat energy if you know what I mean mm. Nolan I mean for, just kind of wrote for very... those of you well let's for the audience uh, save the cat is a very popular screenwriting book it lays out a pretty specific formula that you're supposed to follow when writing a screenplay and like that formula is not necessarily bad but in something like I want you back it is incredibly obvious uh, that they're just following the formula you know and it, it you can is see a, the writing on the wall exactly you can see the writing and it's a negative uh, yeah. like there's a there's a part earlier in the movie I'm gonna try not to spoil anything too crazy but there's a part earlier in the movie where Jenny Slate talks about like you know the person she loves does a certain thing or like when you love somebody a lot you do a certain thing for them like on an airplane and then at the end of the movie her and Charlie are at like you know they're in a pretty bad spot relationship wise and they end up on an airplane and guess what charlie does he does the thing that she was talking about i'm, I'm literally wow, reading it right now it's so and sweet and i'm it's looking at like the... it's so contrived it's just like it's set up way too perfectly earlier in the movie in a way where you can just tell like even when they do it because it's so random when she says it she's just like oh yeah we're having a normal conversation and uh oh yeah this is a really specific action that lets me know that, like, I'm going to stay with this person forever. And I was like, oh, I bet someone's going to do that later. And then, yeah, they so, did. So I'm reading the Wikipedia page right now. And in, like, perfect, like, I guess, like, uh, symmetry is it's in the first paragraph, second sentence of the first paragraph. And it's in the last sentence of the, of the, of the uh, synopsis. So, you know, it's an important thing if it's made the wiki. Um, and right. you're right. I'm, it's an I'm incredibly surprised that the wiki is that detailed at this point. It's this an, it's what the thing out is like four days ago. Wiki plots are usually pretty solid. I would, I will say, I'm not sure who writes them, but they are a, a God and a God. You got to imagine that it's Amazon doing it, right? Like it's part of the press package Probably. to make a Wikipedia page for the movie. Yeah, that would actually make a lot of sense. Speaking of, I mean, you were saying you were like, you know, rejoicing at the return of a mid budget movie but then again mid but like streaming really is the home of mid budget i mean right. if you think about it yeah right. and so it's like all these movies that like for example netflix is pushing for awards they're all like mid budget art movies yeah they're spending all that rest of that money on well campaigning. there's there's a difference between like you know a mid budget art movie like roma or something versus like a broad mid budget comedy true because really like the the movies that i miss are not artsy mid-budget movies the movies that i miss are mid-budget comedies with legitimate talent like well-known comedy talent in them that's not yeah. adam sandler or will ferrell as much as i do yeah. love those guys yeah that's true and like you would hope you know like like some pretty solid writing you know i mean you said like i said right. it was solid but oh so no, okay it's clear so it's very clear that the people who wrote this movie and i believe maybe a couple uh, maybe I'm just assuming that because it's a romantic Two. comedy, Isaac. but it is, a, it is a woman and a man, and it's a team. Um, Correct. Yeah. But they're clearly very capable and, like, very technically sound. Like, the fundamentals of this movie are very strong, but it's just, like, it's like they're too strong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you can it's see... formulaic. You can see all the... Exactly. It's formulaic, and you can see all the... Uh, techniques and devices that they're using from miles away which like it's not seems... like this is you know trying to be a super subtle oscar winning movie but it's definitely a negative probably the biggest I mean, negative for me outside of the comedy the other biggest question is uh so how is the romance is it believable the romance is pretty great um, I will say this movie is two hours when it could have easily ended at 90 minutes and been much better, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. It would have ended on a two super... Two hours, yeah, what? Yeah, it would have ended on a super downer note at 90 minutes, but I kind of loved it. I thought the movie was going to end at that point. Um, hard, to, hard to say which point it is when you're not spoiling it, but basically, like, they... When their whole plan is finished... There's another 30 minutes left in the movie that just do not need to be there. Mm. That's a shame. I they mean, because you never they that's do never... a lot of development and stuff, and it's how they, I mean, 
I can say this. It's a romantic comedy. It's how they ultimately end up back together and everything, but I really didn't need that from them. You just would have had the rom-com end on the uh, lowest possible moment. Okay, well, I, it's hard to do this without spoiling it, but it ends in like a really excellent way where it's like one of the characters is kind of like just put back right where they started and the other one is actually like has successfully completed their plot and has ended up back with you know his ex Fair. shit i okay. just gave it away um yeah i was anyway, gonna say hmm, anyway interesting. one of one of their there could be either one of them x um, yeah okay but anyway and and then you know the other one feels just incredibly shorted and alone and it would have been a great spot to end the movie but it's a romantic comedy and you know it's it's a double edged sword. I love the mid budget studio romantic comedy, the broad kind of thing. But you can't have that kind of ending, you know, in that movie. This isn't like new Hollywood Robert Altman, whatever. No, it's some studio fare, like you said. It's it's what you want, and by the way, that is what you want. Like, I mean the best version of that I guess is like what when Harry met Sally and then everything else is kinda of just trying to go for that. And right. also all, I guess all those other Nor Ephron things. Right. Yeah, and like I mean, you're right. Those none of those should stretch past ninety minutes. But you yeah, know, I'm the, also the glad to see it. I'm also glad to see really... Charlie Day. Yeah. yeah, Charlie Day. Always love to see him out there doing good work. Jenny Slate. I always have felt like I don't see her enough. You know, Agreed. like ever I totally since agree. I first saw her, I was like, "Why aren't you in more stuff?" And she just don't. She never is. Like she, I feel like she so rarely works, or at least like doesn't work on stuff that i watch but every time i see her i just i love it i do too and it, you're right i mean it was kind of a a knock against it i'm not not a knock i don't think but like i wanted to watch this movie but when you said that jenny slate doesn't quite bring that same energy i was a little you know down a little bit by that because like like you said like when she's in parks and rec and all these things she uh, shows up and she's like so on it very captivating right. so. she's out there i mean look she still Should I watch has it? a lot of yeah i'd say yeah well it depends i mean you're not really a romantic comedy guy this is not good enough where i would say if you don't like romantic comedies you should still watch it but mm-hmm. if you do like romantic comedies or if you're in the mood or i don't know if your girlfriend likes romantic comedies or whatever i'm talking to the audience in general now obviously not you nolan but yeah thank you um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh then yeah i would turn it on it's it's better than a lot of other romantic comedies um but i wouldn't say it's super great or anything there is a version of this movie where they just let charlie and jenny slate be as crazy as they want that probably ends up looking a lot more like horrible bosses which that and Pacific Rim are the other two big Charlie Day movie roles. Yeah, I, I would. Say. I would love to so watch I can't the re- horrible bosses version of this premise. Yeah, that's true. Um, I will say, like, I was kind of hoping that this movie. I don't think it's really done that well, necessarily. It's hard to say. Well, it's, but it's all streaming, so. right? It's is it out in yeah. theaters? I don't think it is in Houston. No, I don't think it is at all. But that's what I want to say. Like, I don't think then you just go by word of mouth and. Right, Not and I mean, does, I know Netflix is super behind the curtain with their numbers. I I would assume Amazon and the other streamers are the same way. Yeah, they all have like these weird metrics, and I can't ever wrap my head around them. But I will say, right. I was kind of hoping for this movie to do well because, like, I I'm with you. Like, I kind of wanted, you know, these aren't like when people when these are on and I walk into a room, right? I like them, right? Like you know, but I never turn them on. But I like them when they're around. So I don't know. I could see these being, you know, like a whole slate of these, but I don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, me neither. And, I mean, you mentioned the Big Sick earlier, but this is definitely... Also Amazon. But this is definitely a different kind of movie. Big Sick was 100% a lot cheaper. I mean, Kumail Nanjani was not even remotely close to as big as he is now. He was still the guy from Silicon Valley when they did that movie. Um, This is, like, proven talent... One from like the longest running live action TV show on right now, and mm-hmm. one from like I don't know. Jenny Slate is such a weird, is in such a weird she, place. Does she for do stand up or something? Like, I, I, mean, I don't you know. think so. 
like I think she's really pushing for a more serious acting career, and uh, that's great. Like she's good at it. I just don't see her enough. Apparently, she's been in some stuff. I'm looking at her credits right now. She's been doing a lot of you know some voice acting and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I, uh, I, but she's I consistently she's, uh, in stuff. I want to say she's a voice in Big Mouth also. Um. Yes, but, she is yeah, a voice in Big she's, Mouth, she's and a lot of other mouth. shows. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, okay, maybe she's okay. Doing so voice she's around, and we don't, oh, and we don't see her, but not not a, a Jacqueline pointed out. Have you seen Obvious Child? I have not. I do remember when that either. movie was coming out, though, because it was at the same time that Jane the Virgin was coming out, and I always got them confused. Yeah, I I never did either. I think I just remember because of the poster or something like that. Right. Um. But hey, Jacqueline, tell me how how that movie is. Let me know in the chat. Um, or you could uh, yeah, call so in. You could call in if you would like. But then we'd have to get a whole different Zoom situation. Talk, talk going Jenny on. Slate. No, I got the Google Voice set up, dog. Yeah. Um, I know you haven't seen Kimmy, but I yeah, feel like this movie was way fucking cheaper <laughs> than the other one. Well, Steven Soderbergh, he doesn't really work expensive, except for cast. And oceans. I mean, even the, even then, this one is like this. I mean, like even then, this one is like this clearly designed to be. I I guess thrifty. So okay, Kimmy, right on HBO Max, written by David Kep. Wait, who real I, fast, I love. real fast. One question: Is it shot on iPhone? Yeah, tell me. No. Okay, so no. This is a no. I was gonna make a point about that. For context, um, Steven Soderbergh did a bunch of movies with Netflix that he shot on iPhone, and I didn't like any of them. Yes, and uh, yeah. So I was gonna get to that. I'll just get to it now. Right. Um, I'm a Steven Soderbergh fan. Let's, uh, you know, up front. But the thing that he's best at, especially now with his like super high output, I would say he's just very technically in this type of stuff that he works with. Kimmy, uh, don't, no sudden move. Logan Lucky. He's very technically tasteful. I would say camera moves because and he shoots his, his own stuff. And I always love his music. And I'll get to that later. Um, but this is the same case. Technically, it's like there's no complaints. It looks really good. All the camera work is like really impressive. All the sound design is is really cool. But outside of that, for basically all of those movies, I don't really have any other opinions because they're not movies of like, it's, it, I don't want to say it's like a criticism. They're not movies of substance. They're just movies that are movies. It couldn't be anything else. They're not great stories or anything like that. They don't right. have like amazing he's, he's characters. He's not shooting for impact. No, they're like pulp. Like they're just like enjoyable for what they are. I, right. I don't really have an, another way to describe it. And this one falls like squarely in that category. I don't really know the plot because I didn't really care. It's pretty easy to understand. It's basically you take like a little bit of Siri and you take a little bit of the conversation and you put them together with some COVID. And that's oh, basically it's a, your it's movie. It's a COVID movie? It's super covid -y. I mean, it has every COVID oh, man. like trapping in it. Every single one. People, it's about working home. It's about spying on your neighbors. It's about tech, you know, the infiltration of technology. There's some really ham-handed criticism of tech corporations because it's about a smart device called Kimmy that listens to your oh, conversations. Jesus. Hold on. It, the COVID is a mentioned thing in the movie as like everybody wears masks and on top of that there's a massive amount of protests happening in the background not racial protests mass mind protests you. no just like work fuck you tech protests oh, basically man. <laughs> this is so like... oh man See, i i, I this is why i didn't want to talk like, about it i mean i always hate like you know don't get me wrong i don't you know, simp for big tech or anything, but I, I have yet to see outside of the social network, which really like they should, they should, I don't want to say they should do a sequel, but there really should be a big, big tech version of like, you know, social network and Steve jobs movies, because I mean, it, it has, there's just, it has gone to a completely different level since the social network came out. But I, I have yet to see a legitimately good movie that criticizes big tech in, like, an effective way. Like, Don't Look Up, for example, 
we've talked about that a lot in a negative way, but the criticism of big tech or tech billionaires or people like Jeff Bezos or whoever was one of the worst parts of the movie. What's that guy's name? Mark, uh, Mark something? Mark Rylance. Mark Rylance. He was yeah. truly awful in that movie. I'm sorry, Mark Rylance. I'm sure you've done great work, but... He has. And I know you're listening, so... You know, that was just... That Hi, was Mark. not it. That was not it. Um, and yeah. I, you know, I haven't seen Kimmy, but... You know, I have... Like I said, I have yet to see a good criticism of big tech outside of the social network or, you know, the first couple seasons of black mirror. But like, if you want to talk about legitimate criticisms or anything like that, like, let's not talk about a Steven Soderbergh movie. Like, this is my, this is my point. I'm here to just talk about the music and the sound design and the cine. Cause that's literally all I buy in for anymore with Steven Soderbergh. And actually right. to be fair, that's all the things I liked from him from the beginning. You know, he's just tasteful. Okay, well now he hold makes... on, hold on. Steven Soderbergh is not just like some technical guy, and that's it. He's made no. some truly incredible, like some of the best movies of the two thousands. Yeah, but that's not like why I go back to him or anything like that. Like I've if Aaron Brockovich, you're a goddamn great movie. Sex Lies and Video Type, you too. But guess what I watch? The Informant? Like, every month. No, I watch the Oceans movies because they sound great and they look great and they're just nice to have on as an atmosphere. Well, Same o with no, Kimmy. They're legitimately, Oceans are some of the greatest heist movies ever. Sure, but like who care? I don't care. That's you, Oh my God. I don't care about any of that. I mean, that's, I guess that's yeah, not Oceans why, isn't really know? like a personal impact kind of movie. No, none of his, well, I guess Sex Lies and Videotape is. The Informant. And so is Aaron Brockovich. I haven't seen The Informant. The Informant Confession. is one of my favorite movies, maybe ever. Matt Damon's best role, for sure. Scott Bakula it as well. Um, it's oh, just hey, hysterical. Whoa, 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 whoa. Scott Bakula's the legend. Yeah, I That's know. His, it's it's his, it's one of his work. best parts. It's just hysterical. I mean, the writing's incredible. The satire is super on point. And the story is honestly very interesting. It's like it's one of those movies where it's like you find a thread in your sock and then you pull it. And then like five minutes later, your entire sock is gone. Right. Good. Good metaphor. Sure. It's it's just one of those. movies. But it's where, funny. Where it it's just a funny. Sock. Un, it just unravels, <laughs> unravels, unravels. And everything keeps getting worse because of how hard Matt Damon's trying. And it's just so funny. I mean, that is an excellent movie. I would recommend that to anyone and everyone. I think it's streaming somewhere. I'll do a quick Google there. Hey, while you're Googling, hey, tell me who did the music for that one? Because it's one of two people. Okay, how so am I supposed to know? You're the only person that can, like, tell people without looking it up who did the music. <laughs> well, I'm disappointed. Um, so, Unless well, it's I like can tell Trent you Trent Reznor or something, but it's, it's not. One of two, it's one of two people because he basically works with one of two people, both of whom I love. Cliff Martinez and uh, David Holmes, who I love more, I will confess. Um, but this one's a Cliff Martinez one for Kimmy, and it's pretty good, I would say. So basically, I like the score. It's about 26 minutes of score, which means okay. I like about 26 minutes of this movie. Excellent. Pretty, nice. pretty much, yeah. Okay, Marvin Hamlish did the music for this. Marvin Hamlish? You're goddamn right. Dude, that's no, hold on. That is really weird. Like, he did the music for a bunch of stage musicals, and nobody does it better. The Bond Sophie's movie, Choice, which has this, like, behind the, he did crazy behind the Candelabra, disco. behind yeah, the Candelabra, makes, also with Soderbergh. Three minutes, he's a baby. like a he's he's like a also, he's like known as like a songwriter and stuff. Anyway, oh, Jacqueline, uh, he did Hamlet. The Way We Were, also, actually, which I saw you mention earlier in the in the chat. Um, this guy's all over the place. I mean, the score is pretty fantastic. I will say, every, I mean, I just love everything about The Informant. It's my favorite Soderbergh. It's my favorite Matt Damon. It's my favorite a lot of stuff. And it's about soybeans, which I'm just like a huge fan of soybeans in general. Oh, okay. That's all well and good. But you should have led with Marvin Hamlish. I would have been one foot in the door. Okay. Now I'm going to watch it tonight. Yeah, I, I bet. It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now now that I know it has guaranteed good music, I'm in. See, you just can't go to me with anything else. 
with Soderbergh. So you only watch Soderbergh for the music? I'm not even kidding. 100%. And his sound design. Sound design is really, really, really nice. Okay. It's usually very quiet and like relaxed. So, yeah. I wouldn't call the informant relaxed in any sort of way. I mean, it's Midwestern, so it goes a little okay. slower, maybe. Sideways. Like yeah. <laughs> the people kind of talk, get to things and conversations a little more in a roundabout way. But it is definitely not a relaxed movie. Like I said, it's very much like a snowball or like a sock unraveling. It's just just constantly downhill. And Matt Damon keeps like digging himself into a hole so hard and it's just hysterical. So not a good movie to fall asleep to? No, I mean, it would work. The visual style is very bright and, well, I don't know. It looks like a mid 2000s Soderbergh this movie. movie. I, no, the visual style is excellent. It just looks like no, oh, yeah. It looks like a guy in mean. the Midwest who is making a lot of money at a super boring job and really enjoying his life at home. So, like at home, it's very happy. He's got like his Corvette and everything. When he goes to work at Archer Daniels Midland, it's like super like I don't want to say Enron-y, but very much it's like, like it's kind of what something it's going sketchy for, right? going on yeah no that's the thing that's why i love this movie they nail it they nail everything yeah and it's based on yeah. a true story which is pretty great because it's just so ridiculous you never saw the one he did for netflix about the panama papers did you uh the laundromat no i did not that's meryl streep right uh, yeah yeah the only one of his netflix movies that i watched was uh Wow, I can't even remember the title of it. The one about the NBA with Lakeith Stanfield. Basketball? No, yeah. not, not basketball. It's not called The basketball. one about basketball. It's called like A Bird in Flight or something. or like No, how sure, I know, but it's the one about basketball. Yeah. yeah, it's about the NBA lockout. I didn't know the name of it. Yeah. I'm going to quick Google here. Okay. Well, anyway, wow, so I won't so watch. many movies. It's called High well, Flying is- Bird. And, I'm not uh, going to watch any, anything. It does not have Stanfield. I'm a, I'm a dipshit. It has Zazie Beetz, also from Atlanta. Not the yeah, city, those... the, tel- the television show on FX. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not going to watch any of his iPhone stuff because, like I said, if I'm here for the technical stuff, why? Why would I? Yeah, so that, no that whole movie was shot with iPhone from, like, security camera angles in the top corner of rooms. Yeah, it was I don't hor- know. Horrendous visually. That's where the taste goes out the window. So you know. Right. I mean, look. It's I what, that's the thing with Soderbergh. He always gets what he's going for. If he wants to make like a sweaty mom romp about male strippers, he makes Magic Mike, and it's an absolute you know classic for that niche. And if he wants to make a super intense pandemic movie, he makes Contagion, and it's like or Kimmy. As, it's as good as it gets. And if he wants to make a heist movie, he makes three of the best heist movies ever. You know, he Yeah. That's the thing, is he always executes. It's just recently I feel like he's been going for volume and pretty low ambition kind of stuff. Yeah, he clearly he's in like a Woody Allen phase. Like he's just like, I'm gonna I got just these opportunities. Basically, like, yeah, I have a once in a lifetime deal. He has a where blank I can just check, yeah. Make a movie every year if I want to. And he clearly does want to do that. Yeah, and I fully support that. No, because I, I do too. That means I mean, if I don't like one, I just gotta wait a year, <laughs> right? And it might have one with some better music. It's it's like Kenneth Branagh. I all due respect. You know, they're they're really going at it. They're working harder than pretty much anybody. But you know, the output is just very like six and a half out of ten. Yeah, it's it's it's. I would say it's consistently middle of the road for him. For sure. Right. Yeah. What was the last Soderbergh movie that then you would say was exceptional? Logan Lucky? 2017? Uh, no, I was not a fan of Logan Lucky. Daniel Craig doing okay. any sort of American accent is just a massive turnoff for me. I don't think he's very no good go. at them. Okay. I don't think that it belongs. He's still James Bond to me. Forever will be. Um, but Good to no, know. I, he can't I, escape like, that. <laughs> The Logan Lucky American accent is significantly better than the Knives Out trash, like 100%, Louisiana 100%. sexy detective accent, but it is still not good. And Logan Lucky is definitely like a six and a half out of ten, like really solid whatever movie. 
I'd say the last like exceptional Soderbergh movie that I watched, Conti- well, that came out actually the most recent because I saw The Informant after I saw the one that I'm about to say, but Contagion. I mean, I think that's a twenty. I, was say tw- I think that's a 2013. Um, 2014. I'm pretty sure. Let me quick quick Google, but Contagion okay. is truly like, and I mean, for obvious reasons, it is aged like 2011. Wow. Um, wow. Holy shit. Yeah, for obvious reasons, it has aged like a fine, fine, fine wine. But, I mean, even when I saw it in the theater, my mind was just like blown. And I was 13 when I saw it in the theater. And even then, I was like, this is just an incredible movie. Like, it's Contagion oh. is so real. When they talk about touching your face. Hey, while you have the doc, uh, the the Google you know page open, who did the music for that? Was it Cliff oh. Martinez? <laughs> I just closed the Google page. God damn it. it. Okay. I'm going back to no, it. No, I got it. I could look it up. I mean, do no, you see? I'm already it's, there. It's... Who did um, it? Dude, yeah. Steven Soderbergh is just, you know, he's just on it all the time. He's great. He's great, and he's just consistent. Cliff Martinez, like, yeah, did the music Cliff for Martinez. Contagion. Yeah, okay, that makes yeah. sense. Um, all right, well, The man cool. just executes. I mean, I... What can you say? So did he well, execute I don't know. with Kimmy? What did he set out to do, and how did he execute? Okay, so what he set out to do was, I guess, make a COVID-y, a really COVID-y movie thriller. Okay, wait, what you is know. that? What is that COVID movie that came out that I believe had John David Washington in it, maybe? Uh, and Zendaya. Um. Oh man, it was like a I'm super not sure. duper COVID-y movie. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up. You oh, keep going. Malcolm wait, and was, Marie. Yeah, it was... Yeah. Um, yep, it is. It's John David Washington, Zendaya, nobody else. It's I mean, super, I don't know. It was like the first movie that was shot during COVID that came out. Gotcha. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, that was way back, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I would say like... Says, I mean, ooh, Malcolm and Marie. I haven't seen yeah, it, thanks. but uh, I guess I won't see it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to see it either. But I would say, like, I mean, it's more just like this movie takes place where, like, it's under the same conditions, which opens it up to the criticism about Big Tech I was talking about. So that's clearly there, but, like, not really. I mean, that's clearly not the focus. The focus is making just a pretty stock, standard conversation style thriller. Um, like, very the paranoid. Conversation? The conversation, yeah. Like, Gene Hackman, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. No, there are like literal sequences that are directly copied from the conversation. Wow. I mean, in terms of it's about a woman who overhears and cleans up the audio of just a like an audio feed and then hears somebody an act of violence like happening and somebody doesn't know what to do about it. Tries to wow. take it to her higher ups who work for guess what? Tech company. So um for you know, it's basically you- that how does the ex Real fast, for those of you in the audience who haven't seen it, the conversation is currently streaming on Hulu and Paramount Plus. Classic movie. Go check it out. 10 out of 10 recommend. Yeah. Um, but anyway, how does he execute in that? I mean, as a as a as a copy, I guess, or riff on the conversation, I would say pretty good. Like I've seen a lot worse. A lot worse. Okay. So this one is solid. I mean, it's it's rock solid. It's in one ear and out the other. Especially if you're me, because of what I'm interested in. Um, but so, like, I can't recommend it. It didn't suck, but it wasn't good either. Make of that what you will. Okay, so it sounds like if you had to pick one, you should probably watch I Want You Back instead. Probably. Listen to Kimmy, though. Listen to Kimmy? Oh, you mean the music. Sure, or the movie. I mean, the movie is the sound of them. It's pretty, pretty calming and stuff. Okay, okay, interesting. All right, well, do you think Kimmy can compete for the movie title belt? I know that I want you Absol- back. Cannot. No, no chance. But if there was a movie title sub belt for score, which there should be, uh, disagree. I would, I would nominate. Yeah, see, God, well, you're yeah. the only person that cares about score like that outside of actual composers and members of the Academy. But it's, but I care so much. I care for the both of us. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, yeah, I, not enough. I can see. I want you okay, back. Fine. Does not take the title belt. Kimmy does not take the title belt. Jackass Four still the best movie of 2022. 
if you haven't seen it yet, you got to see it. It's just, it's incredible. It's so funny. All right. Well, Nolan, I think we should probably wrap up this movie talk here and get to trivia. Thanks for coming on. Um, sure. I, no I'll problem. see you next week. Probably, right? Probably so. Yep. All right. Well, now it is the moment that you've all been waiting for. It's trivia. It's fuck it. We're doing it live trivia. Welcome to the first game of Superb Owl Trivia. In this game, I will ask you five superb questions about owls. And if you get all five questions right, you could win tonight's swear jar. That's right. Anytime I use a swear word, a quarter goes into tonight's swear jar. Right now, we are at 13 quarters. That is $3.25. That number only goes up. So if you would like to play Superb Owl Trivia... You go ahead and call in, and the first caller gets to play. And I'm going to just give you all a little interlude music while I wait. This is Deep Fake Kevin Harlan, and you are listening to Fuck It. We're doing it live. We're doing it live. Would you look at that? We got ourselves a call. Call from... Parker... Oh, interesting. Parker, are you there? Hey, look who it is. Look who decided to show up. What's up, Parker? How you doing? Doing well. I'm here with two friends. All right. Well, you can use them to, you can use them as some street shout outs for superb owl trivia, but don't be lame and start Googling shit. That's a free quarter for you. All right. Well, here's how the game works. I will ask you five questions about superb owls. And if you can answer all the questions right, you will win the contents of tonight's swear jar, currently valued at $3.50. But you also get the opportunity to shout your Venmo out to my very rich and generous audience. So that's pretty valuable too. All right, you ready to play? Wait, let me set my Venmo out. Um, well, hold no, no, no. Only is, if you win. Only uh, if you win. Calm down. Calm down. Oh, only if I win. I see. Yeah. All right. That makes more sense. Okay, I'm ready. All right, you ready? Question number one. A group of owls is called A, a school, B, a parliament, C, a murder. Oh. Murders are crows, apparently. Uh, I'm liking Parliament. Parliament was B. Is that your yeah. final answer? A Parliament of Owls. I think it's going to have to be. Parliament of Owls is B. Correct. Correct, Parker. Oh. It is a Parliament of Owls. That term was actually coined uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia series. Fun fact there. Uh, whoever oh. said a murder is crows, also very smart. That is correct. Tell me that was right. Murder is crows. He knows. He, so, he, he knows. Good shit. That's another quarter for you in the jar. All right. Question number two. An owl can turn its head A, 270 degrees, B, 180 degrees, C, 360 degrees. I think it's 360. The, the, the 200 one, though, is a random one to throw out. Yeah, it's I know, but I'm thinking it's 360. I feel like I've always heard it. How far can they turn their head around? How many degrees? An owl. I'm going. Okay, we have 280. I, we're gonna split it. No, you know what? I'm I'm going with what I want. We're gonna split it. We're gonna go 275. 275, yeah. Parker. It's multiple choice, dog. I know. Was it A? Wasn't it A? 270. Is that your final answer? Um. Final answer is 365. Oh. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. The answer is A, 270 degrees. Oh, that is terrible. All right. That's okay. You still got three questions left here. All right. Number three here. All owls lay the same color of eggs. Which color are they? A, brown. B, white. C, speckled. That's a weird word, but... You know, white and brown mixed. Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you mean. Uh, I don't think it's speckled. Really? I think it's brown. 
Brendan, white or brown? Okay, I'm going white. You're going white? Final answer? Yeah, final answer. Correct. It is white. Wow. Owls all lay white eggs. All right, final two questions here. Which of these is the largest species of owl in the world? A, Blackiston fish owl. B, Eurasian eagle owl. C, great gray owl. Those all sound pretty huge to me. I'm not going to lie. I was, yeah. Can you, can you repeat option A? Please yeah, please? that is the Blackiston fish <laughs> owl. I don't know where Blackiston is. It kind of looks like it's somewhere in England if I had to, you know, guess. No, they've got some... England doesn't have big birds like that. I'm going to go with B. B, Eurasia. I don't know where that is or what that is, but apparently it's pretty huge. All right, final question here. If you get this right, you can't win the money anymore, but I will let you shout out your Venmo here. So, I appreciate that. Number five, which of these is the smallest species of owl in the world? A, the pygmy owl. B, the elf owl. C, the dusky owl. I like A. I like A, and it's going to be the final answer. Pygmy, pygmy owl, owl is your final answer there? No, B, elf owl. Elf owl, final answer? Final answer. That is correct, Elf Owl. All right, Parker. Thank you for calling in and playing superb owl trivia. The swear jar is now at fifteen quarters, which is uh three dollars and seventy five cents. You can't win that, but I will let you shout out your Venmo here. My audience has got a lot of deep pockets and they love giving out money, so let them know where you're at. All right, thanks guys. Yeah, you know where I'm at. I'm I'm uh I'm at PID four six four. Um, don't be hesitant if you enjoyed my time. That is P I B B as in Barack Obama, and was that a four six four Parker? It was, yeah, similar to my Instagram, which is also Parker four six four. But you know, all right. Just... Well, if you want to follow Parker four six four on Instagram or Venmo, P I as in private investigator, B as in Barack Obama. 464 as in the numbers 464 you go ahead and venmo my boy parker and you know i don't know maybe you just want to do that maybe you're feeling nice tonight give him slip him slip him a little tip just the tip you know all righty all right parker well, thanks you. for calling in tonight man yes thank you all right well you have a good night all right well uh, that's it for Superb Owl Trivia. Join us next week. We're going to be talking about the new action-adventure movie starring Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg. That is, of course, Uncharted. Nolan and I are both huge fans of the Uncharted video games, although I believe the only one I've played is Uncharted 3. If I had to guess, I believe it was Uncharted 3, but it was exquisite. So it'll be interesting to see how they put it on screen. The games are very cinematic. I mean, they play like an Indiana Jones movie, so it should be pretty doable, but we'll see if they can execute. We'll also go a little bit deeper on video game movies. You know, like, what do we think about the ones that have come out? What do we think about the ones that studios already have lined up to come out? And what video games would we actually like to see made into movies? That'll be a great talk. Make sure to tune in live on Twitch next Tuesday at 10 p.m. Central. That's all we have for you tonight. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next Tuesday. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks again for watching. We'll leave you with Sting and a cut off his new album. Take it away.